great pleasure in introducing Professor Keith Davids. Um, I've known Keith for a number of years now. Um, normally when I have a, a question um, in my sport that I'm working in, I go to Keith and he answers it and then provides me about 20 research papers and gives me another 100 questions which I need to find the answer to. So, but really, really, um, really, really insightful person to go and speak to. Um, I've had him in to, to visit um, a couple of sports that I've worked in and, and um, always provides the coaches and the staff um, some really, really useful information and some key takeaways. So um, as much as Keith, Keith knows his stuff about this area, he's also kind of a wonderful guy and a real good personality to speak to as well. So um, Keith currently holds a Professor of Motor Learning at Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. Um, but before that has, has over 30 years experience um, teaching and conducting research uh, in a kind of area of skill acquisition, motor learning. Um, and has held positions in the UK, Finland, New Zealand and in Australia. Um, and, and one, I just asked Keith uh, to share something that you may not already know about him, but Keith uh, played competitive football up until the age of 58. Um, up over in uh, Queensland in Australia, so he's still he's still very fighting fit. Still limping. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, over to Professor Keith Davids. Thank you. Thanks for the great great conference venue, great um, mix of people here, and uh, the two people that we can thank or blame, or two of them anyway including Ollie, is uh, Dr. Sami Kayala from uh, the Finnish Olympic Research Committee, got a colleague within uh, Olin as well, uh, and the Finnish Olympic Research Committee with the University of the Ambassador in Finland organised a motor skills conference, uh, which is similar to every two years, and we've done two, Sami, and there's a third one planned in 2019, and after the, um, Oli attended the, um, and Marcus Hollow was there as well, uh, after the last one in November 2017, there was this sort of plan, this idea about, yeah, well maybe we'll host a conference in, in uh, Ireland or somewhere like that, and I thought, maybe, maybe not, and bang, straight away after Christmas is, okay, it's going to go ahead, can you talk, etc. And as Ed pointed out, he just couldn't say no, he couldn't turn that down, so very quickly, um, you know, there was the opportunity to talk here. And, and what a wonderful audience, this mix of practitioners and scientists and uh, coaches, etc. It's just a, it's a wonderful um, context for sharing ideas and exchanging information. And that's what I want to focus on, the uh, exchanging information between academics and practitioners. More of it should go on, some of it does go on, a bit accidentally maybe, a bit um, haphazardly. Maybe it should be a bit more formalised. That's going to be one of the take-home messages uh, from this talk. So, I'm going to focus on academic research, the relationship between science, theory, and practice, and how they can all enrich each other, how we can all enrich each other's work. Uh, this is, if you like, a bit of a, a mantra for me. Um, apparently, Kurt and William didn't actually say this quote. There's so many examples where people, quotes are attributed to people, and they didn't actually say it, but it doesn't matter. The sentiment is there, and that's what captures my uh, approach, what I feel that I would like to contribute to this uh, wonderful interaction between coaches, practitioners, and scientists. There's nothing so practical as a good theory. How we use that theory is quite important. Um, and I think that also theories can be enriched by practice as well. So there's this two-way interaction that we must uh, bear in mind and use in our work. Uh, in the past, sports science, I think it's been guilty of having this top-down hierarchical approach that we would gift knowledge to uh, practitioners. It's changing now. And one of the take-home messages is the last slide, in fact, you can see I'm calling for this uh, more richer interactions between practitioners and scientists. Going back to theory then, it started back in the 1990s at Cronel Sager, just south of Manchester, um, the research group there. This is where we started to talk about these ideas, the ecological dynamics. Ecological dynamics as a framework emphasises the athlete-environment relationship. Okay, just get your head around that for a moment. 
athlete environment relationship. Not the athlete only, not the environment only, but the point of interaction. So if you challenge coaches to sort of say, well, if you, you, know, if you, if you agree to these theoretical principles, if you like them, then that point of interaction, the athlete environment relationship, that, if you like, being explored in your designs, this, that principle in forming your design, that's a really hard thing to do. It's a really, for me anyway, it's a really hard thing to think about, but that point is where the, um, the design interactions occur. To get that right is pretty tricky and challenging. So some of these papers then focused on the theoretical rationale here, and uh, it's great to see Mick Court here. With Mick, so you won't get, I'm not sure if you can see this red laser light. Down the bottom here, one of these papers here, Mick Court. Back, uh, his PhD student is just sitting over there. You can put your hand up if you want to make it very quickly. That's <laughs> yeah. Working uh, for an English Premier League club um, at the moment for a few years. Um, Mick, his PhD, contributed to this notion uh, and, and, and actually debunked a long time ago a misconception uh, in constraints based coaching, ecological dynamics. Some people who don't fully understand it have a superficial understanding. They consider the idea that ecological dynamics doesn't um, have room for cognitive activity. So the mental side of things is not part of ecological dynamics. It's not true, it's never been true, and 20 years ago, uh, people like Chris Button and Nick Court were writing papers to show how the mental side of life can be embedded in the dynamics. The dynamics informs the mental aspect, whether it's intentionality. So intentionality essentially refers to cognition, cognitive activity, any planning, any thinking, any, any anticipation, attention, all of that is captured by intentionality. Any coaches here? Any time you plan a drill, you have an intention. There's an intention. Attack, defend, um, move down the right, climb a rock face, hit a target in a certain way, there's an intention, intention there. Intentionality frames perception and action. And perception actually occurs in line with intentionality. Other things in frame perception and action as well. Anxiety, how anxious you're feeling, your mental state, your emotions, etc. A long time ago, that's one misconception that was debunked um, from an ecological dynamics perspective. Ecological dynamics is still evolving, so these were the early papers, essentially where we were, if you like, announcing the idea to sports science to say there are other ways of looking at uh, human behaviour, performance, skill acquisition, etc., uh, rather than the, the typical traditional model, the information processing model. There's also this sort of rationale for looking at uh, the personal environment relationship as being the basis of human behaviour, interaction in sport as well as other uh, contexts. And so these were some of the early um, papers. The model here, we haven't had enough triangles this morning. Has anybody noticed that? So uh, here we are, the triangle. Uh, a few years ago, a colleague and I, a wonderful uh, PhD student, ex-PhD student, now he's an associate prof, Dwight Arousia from the University of Lisbon, we wrote a paper uh, where we, tongue in cheek, argued that we shouldn't be talking about skill acquisition as if you're acquiring something that you store in your brain, in your mind. We should be talking about skill adaptation. So becoming skillful means somebody becoming better adapted to your environment, you know, from like an evolutionary, ecological sense. And a coach's role, and the athlete's role, is to enhance their adaptation to a particular environmental context. Uh, and this model fits quite nicely. It got picked up by a, a philosophy journal, actually, uh, and we were thrilled to find that uh, a completely unrelated picture of an athlete hitting a tennis ball was on the front cover of that journal. Probably never happened ever since. Nothing to do with us at all, but the article was in there. They really liked the idea uh, of the article uh, in that particular issue. So this is the model here, essentially. So you have this relationship between the performer, all aspects of the performer, the mental side, the, the um, 
the physical side, etc., all the different dimensions of the performer, the task, the specificity of the task that you're performing or uh, learning, and the environmental uh, constraints as well, including the physical constraints that Nick talked about yesterday quite nicely, and the social constraints, the social interaction as well. Sport is a social context as well. So it's through this rich interaction here, that's the important thing about constraints, they're constantly interacting. And you get this coupling of information and movement. This is the basis of coaching for me, learning, design and coaching, is understanding what information is present. When you design a learning task, a practice task, what information is present there at the time with your design? Are you using cones? Are you using line markings, space manipulation, etc.? Um, what sort of surface are you, are you asking somebody to perform on? Whether they, for example, if they're a climber and you're using an indoor climbing wall, what is the information? What are the properties of that surface, and how does that relate to the movements of the athlete? And this is what's adapted. This is a skill is enhanced, this relationship between information and movement. We're pretty good. This, this morning's presentation showed really nicely how good we are at picking up information, perceiving information, and using information to regulate our actions. We actually use lots of different sources of information. And we, we do it continuously. Some of it's subconscious, some of it's conscious but it's a, an important aspect. And the tighter, the more stable this relationship becomes, the more skillful an athlete becomes. And from this, this, this coupling, these couplings, allow us to pick up affordances. Marco Sullivan yesterday talked about affordances from the environment. And affordances, so, uh, anything in the environment, another person, an object, a situation, a event, that offers you an opportunity to act, that invites a behaviour from you. And if you think of learning design as a coach or a practitioner, when you design a practice task, you're looking at the affordances there. What are you inviting from an athlete? For example, if you um, want an athlete to catch a ball with one hand, with the right hand, with the left hand, with two hands, how are you going to invite those catches? Are you going to instruct? Are you going to just verbally? If it was simple, like that, I'll tell you what to do, you do it. I'd be a coach, I'm not a coach. It's far too complex, as you know. Um, so instead you design a practice task that invites certain uh, um, actions. So if you want an athlete to work on a, a left hand movement, etc., design a task that invites a left hand and not a right hand movement. And these affordances are what are designed into the environment. And if this, is, this is the basis of our learning design in sports practice task. Helping athletes to discover and explore and then exploit opportunities for action in a particular practice environment which should simulate, faithfully simulate, a performance environment. It can't sit, some people then, another misconception for, of the ecological dynamics approach Essentially, the idea is, is that so we should always practice in a highly specific environment. So that means we should just play games all the time. Well, that's not true as well. Games are good to design, and you can manipulate constraints in conditioned games and uh, conditioned tasks. But you don't have to be playing in the full intensity of the full game or the full activity. Uh, if you're a climber, you don't have to be in the Alps all the time climbing to be constantly on that learning curve. You can design tasks in different environments that might vary in their specificity, but you're supporting that athlete's development in a way that you should understand, that you're trying to understand. So some of the, the skills, the processes, the abilities and capacities um, that you're trying to encourage in an athlete um, can be developed in, in an environment that simulates the full performance environment, the full competition environment. And, and that helps them because it means that people are not subjected to that intensity of practice all the time. It's not a good thing all the time, particularly with young athletes, developing athletes, children, where you get 
too much specialisation and too much um, you know, maybe overtraining, over competing all the time, etc. There's some benefits of simulating practice tasks in different ways. So it's shifting between specific representative designs in practice to more general designs. And coaches, it's okay to do that as long as coaches and athletes know why they're doing that. And you're the best people, the coaches in the room, are the best people to make that decision. Okay, so this is the idea that I'm talking about here. One, the other, um, uh, or, or, or a, a, a wonderful theoretical um, uh, influence on the ecological dynamics approach is James Gibson, the ecological psychologist. And Gibson emphasised the importance of information using information to regulate your behaviours. Not just your actions, but your behaviours. Uh, some of this information is specified, according to Gibson's uh, terminology. Essentially, all that means is it's really important information. It really does inform your actions. So if you couple your movements or your actions to certain sources of information, they're specified for you. They really will help you. In other words, they're the gold standard. So for example, if you're a springboard diver, I'm going to talk about that later on, learning to dive in a pool or an aquatic environment, you'll come across specifying sources of information, really gold standard, important sources of information. The feel of the water as your hands rip uh, into it, uh, the context of the diving board, etc., that sort of thing. And some of it is non-specifying, and that's less useful. So for example, if you're a team games player, it might be learning to dribble against static objects, cones and things like that in straight lines. If you're a cricket player, learning to bat against the ball projection machine where you can't see the advanced visual information that was mentioned this morning, this morning's presentation from the bowler, the hand action, the arm action, etc., that can provide uh, useful information to regulate your action or, or affordances from that. So that doesn't mean that we should never be down this end here. What that means, and always be down this end here, doesn't mean that. It means that you can transition along this continuum depending on the needs of your athlete. At all times, the needs of your athlete can guide this decision. Where on this continuum, down the really highly intense end, so you're learning to bat against the fast bowler here, rather than the ball projection machine in the nets in cricket, or you're playing in games, small side of competitive games, rather than uh, trying to uh, practice skills here in this context. You can move up and down here depending on the needs of the learner. And you can immediately, this coach, I'm sure you can think of examples from your own sports where you might design a practice task down at this end here, where learning will be at a slower rate for a while, but that's okay because there may be some consolidation, some reflection, uh, some adaptation that's going on down here. Uh, the transfer is more general, it's less specific, uh, but then you can spend a lot of time down this end here where transfer is much more specific uh, and there's more intensity, there's more, the, the simulation is much more faithful to, <coughs> between the practice environment and the competition environment. And that's, that's where the skill of the, the coach comes in, and the sports practitioner, the sports scientist, etc. The performance analysis advising where an athlete can be located on this continuum at a particular part of their development, stage of their development. Oops, let's go back to that. The busiest slide in the world here. This captures 30, 40 years of research, I'd imagine, you know, for, for a lot of people, not just myself, etc. Um, and mostly, the, the, the top continuum is at the uh, macro time scale of years, or thousands of hours, if you prefer. And Nick talked about um, uh, the, the 10,000 hours um, rule, or the, the idea of it, etc. But the idea of talent development. So the ecological dynamics are focused on developing talent, not identifying talent. In non-linear systems, it's hard to do. Um, the idea of uh, some uh, particular approaches to talent development might emphasize early specialization, and there are associated activities with that. 
And then you've got early, the early diversification approach, which is getting a lot of evidence at the moment. The work of Arne Gulick, for example, um, from Kaiserslautern's university. Uh, really good information there about successful senior athletes practicing, performing, competing actually in four to five, even six different sports. Uh, and then there's this early engagement um, hypothesis here at the moment that hasn't got enough information at the moment. I want to focus on the bottom <coughs> continuum here. This is the microstructure of practice. This is basically what uh, Mark referred to yesterday, he used that term in his talk, the idea of what coaches and athletes do hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, day in, day out. The design of practice activities that you do. The point that uh, we raise here is that essentially what you're doing is what's available to you in your particular activity or sport is a landscape of affordances, opportunities or invitations for action that your athletes or your athlete can accept or reject. Okay? They can interact with uh, through actions, through decision making, through perception, perceiving information and then acting. Where on this landscape you're located, again, will depend on the athlete. So down at one end here, there's very narrow affordances, very limited affordances under very narrow task constraints, quite restricted. So, for example, when you're driving on a golf range, or you are dribbling amongst cones, or you're practicing on an indoor climbing wall, and there's no influence of weather or ambient temperature or, or things like that down at this end here. Very teacher focused, so we would call this structured. I would use that term structured because there's an adult present or a teacher present or a coach present that's leading that activity. At this end of the continuum, there's more of the discovery learning um, and you've got differential learning in there. Those of you who are aware of that particular approach. Uh, informal peer coaching modeling, practicing with each other. Somebody, I was listening to the um, Breakout groups yesterday, somebody made, some, made a really good uh, point about, um, it was over by the, the blackboard that Ollie was having to use yesterday. Um, somebody said to them, why is it that uh, you've got skateboarders and you've got snowboarders and you've got you know, those types of activities, people on BMX bikes, and they're learning these fantastic skills and there's no coach instructing them. Why can't we do that more in other sports, etc.? It's because the culture is like that in those sports. They've organised themselves that way. And I think it was Ollie made the point that, well, that's going to change as soon as they, or Marco Sullivan did actually make the point that that's going to change because when the, um, those sports get brought into the Olympic fold, then there may be more pressure for coaches to be involved, etc. But it's a real culture, a form of life there about exploration, about peer coaching, modelling, watching things, and, and not just copying things, but taking it all further by adding to a trick, by being a bit more innovative than some of the you've seen on the skateboard park, etc. This is where constraints-based coaching is lay, uh, located, on this, um, this end of the continuum. I just realised some of you might not be able to see this uh, red light there. Uh, down here, it's, it's guided discovery. So that there is a role for the coach and teacher, which involves intervening through manipulating constraints. And sometimes a constraint might be uh, intervened in a through verbal instruction, very, very limited, mostly through just adjusting aspects of the practice um, environment. Now the point that I'm trying to make here, this is a key take home message, is it's not that this end of the continuum is bad, never go there, and this end is good, always be there, it's not at all. Go back to that point before, that it depends on the needs of your athlete. Where does your athlete need to be located and what are you trying to achieve with that athlete? Most of the time, really good learning, the best learning would occur down that end of the continuum. Okay, that's, that's what I would argue and that's what a lot of evidence from our research shows. But sometimes it's okay to pull the athlete out, sometimes it's okay to be a bit more structured, use some drills or to provide some um, further instruction in you, just as a guide, as a constraint in a limited way. But don't spend too much time down there. Most of the good learning will, will occur down towards that end of the continuum, particularly the guided discovery end. 
But essentially, the affordances here are much richer, more varied, more extensive than they are down at this end of the continuum. And this is where the coach's skill, art and knowledge comes in about where the athlete needs to be and why. I think too much at the moment, in my opinion, there's a, this people, a lot of people see this as the default. This is, what, this is the default place to be, this is what coaching is, this is what teaching is, this is what learning is, down here. Structured, organised, uh, and controlled. And it's not. Um, in my view, you will get some learning in this end, but the rate of learning will be lower than down at that end there. But I'm happy to discuss and argue that uh, later on. So what does the performance landscape look like? Well, you obviously don't want your athletes searching all over the landscape because literally the landscape of performance is, is huge in your particular context in sport, but also surrounding us. And so the coach's role is to design an environment where some affordances are more inviting than others. Don't make the decision for the athlete and say, I want you to use this affordance. In other words, go and hold the affordance right up against the athlete's face. It's not that at all. It's about trying to design a practice environment where some aspects are more inviting. So here, the, the wider, taller uh, peaks symbolise more inviting affordance fields. So there's certain fields or pockets of that landscape that will be more inviting for an athlete to explore. And you, you encourage exploration by manipulating constraints. And what manipulating constraints does, it just helps the athlete to explore. It helps them to search. You design a task which helps them, helps them to search here, rather than, for example, here. Okay? You see the logic? You see what I'm getting at there? That's, that's the aim of constraints manipulation. Sometimes I get the feeling, and this could be a misconception, a third misconception about ecological dynamics, that people think, they'll say, yeah, I'm using constraints, I'm using constraints-based coaching, but actually what they're doing is over-constraining, or they're under-constraining. To get that right, to get the right type of constraints for that person, environment, interaction, is really demanding, really challenging for the coach. And that is something that I think that uh, coaches can think about and work, work on. How to manipulate constraints to invite certain actions and not others of athletes at a particular time. So they make the decision. And you can do that through emphasizing interactions. Interactions. Mark talked about football interactions yesterday. But it's the same in any sport. You could be interacting with an object um, a hurdle, a javelin, um, a swimming environment, a diving board. It's through those interactions that coaches can, um, if you like, design affordable pockets or fields that are more inviting than others. Some coaches know this and get this. So here is uh, some examples of coaches, what I call experiential knowledge. So early on I talked about empirical knowledge, the knowledge gained from science and theories and how that contributes to our understanding. But there's a rich source of coaches, what I call experiential knowledge. That's the knowledge that you gain day in, day out. Because if you, those of you who are coaches and sports scientists, practitioners, working with athletes, you know you're like experimenters. You test things, you test ideas, you discard things that don't work, you look at other things that might work, then you, you know, refine it a bit, change it, change it up, adapt it, etc. And these are all examples um, of uh, constraints being manipulated. Vision, uh, this, this guy here wearing the goggles when he's dribbling basketball and not um, trying to occlude his vision of his hand and his dribbling so he's got his head up, etc. Uh, this is from the AIS, which Shuttleworth um, uh, did some work here with this. This guy won the go uh, gold in the Commonwealth Games in Malaysia back a while, uh, but you can see here they're manipulating his postural control and balance and getting him to focus on this uh, aspect here by through exaggerating, exaggerating the problem for him. Um, there's other examples of constraints. This is the Australian swimming squad here, working on head location position. Some of these you wouldn't necessarily stay in use for too long, for long periods. But remember, it's all about helping an athlete search. You point them in the right direction and let them search after that and then take the, take the constraint away. Don't let it stay there too long. 
Sometimes the constraints can be, as I said, over constraining, uh, a little bit or under constraining here, um, and there's some question marks. Uh, so, for example, when you're trying to train cognition or perception, and you, you link it to a, a task that lacks context, as, as Nick mentioned this morning, a pointing task, etc. Is there a way that you can make this a little bit, the perception actually a little, a little bit stronger here? Um, the use of uh, people who call this a, a whipsaw, we've got on there, on one ball projection machine or a, a bowler here, but it's also a, a theory machine used here. What's missing from this is the um, the information from a batsman hitting a ball that the field might use to um, predict positions, etc. Maybe creating environments that are very, very static early on might be okay for some learners, but other learners, Mark showed a good example yesterday of dynamic movement uh, amongst people learning to dribble. Um, so I'm going to look at this later on in a bit more detail here, this, this notion here of designing a dry land training environment for springboard diving and the, the, the pros and cons of that. I'm going to get into that in a bit more detail. Uh, it's a good example of experiential knowledge here. Matt Wood, Matt, can you put your hand up right at the front there? Yeah, okay, so Matt's at Cardiff um, Metropolitan University. He corrected me yesterday, I, I thought he was just a the under 18 coach, but he's also coached under 20s and under 21s at world and European level as well. And I met Matt a few years ago, he's, so he's doing a PhD, and I'm helping to supervise that uh, down at Cardiff. And I met him a few years ago and he came up to me after a talk and said, I'm using constraints. I didn't know that I was using constraints. He didn't know the theory about that. He's now following the PhD in that area. He's looking at a constraints-based coaching program with Herbert's coaches. And this is a photo from Matt's work um, in terms of the constraints we use in order to develop these sorts of patterns here. And we get this photo. This is my nephew in New South Wales, Will, Will Lloyd, on the fringe of the uh, Australian urban team. Okay, I thought, I'll talk about research. Um, research in boxing. So, what does the performance landscape mean, and how can, how can it, what does it look like in a laboratory setting? Um, this is a, this is thanks to uh, Diagon, thanks to Don uh, Orth. Don, where are you? Are you around? There he is. There. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so. A very simple study uh, conducted by Robert Rostovsky at the, uh, he's a colleague from Macedonia. So essentially, all Robert did was uh, there were some martial arts students in their first year classes, they did, or second year classes, they'd done one year of boxing and they'd learned the basic strokes, so they weren't experts. And it, the task was to punch the heavy bag. Um, and the, in this study, this experiment, there were no instructions given. So a lot of the experiments that were carried out uh, where we look at the, the effect of constraints on performance behaviours, the, the important thing is not to give specific instructions, just, just to give very general instructions, if you like, just to manipulate the intention, okay, the intentionality. So the idea was, hit the heavy bag, as hard as you can using those actions that you learned. And these are the actions here on this scale up here. And then you've got the sort of heat map emerging. So the, the, these participants were young learners learning to hit a heavy bag and they had these particular strokes. And on the four, essentially all Robert did was to stand the participant a certain distance away, scaled according to arm length, away from the heavy bag, and he moved the participant accordingly. Simple manipulation of distance, okay, to the heavy bag. And at different distances, you had these sort of different affordance landscapes emerging. That's the point. So the, the simple constraints that was manipulated was distance of some uh, of the participant uh, with the intention to hit the heavy bag, not ignore it or avoid it hit it as hard as you can. And at this particular distance here, around about 0.6 scale box of target distance, this rich landscape emerged. All the, all the particular actions emerged. No instructions. It wasn't a case of saying, use all the actions, etc. All the, all the um, strokes 
emerged at that particular scale of distance. At different distances, you've got different landscape uh, emerging. So this is the inactive state here, uh, and at other distances, there's certain states basically didn't, uh, didn't emerge. So the, the point of this research shows that a simple constraints manipulation can allow certain performances to emerge in the landscape. And what you do then, how you, as a coach, how you design uh, your particular task will allow certain performances to emerge and allow learners to use those performances. I just want to talk again, um, and using the, the, the um, individual sports again, with the work uh, on um, climbing, we've done the movement super, the University of War, um, and essentially, the, I just want to talk about, uh, again, no instructions, but just uh, look at examining a group of learners and uh, skilled climbers climbing in an ice cream. So these are ice climbers. And ice climbers climb frozen waterfalls, and they use ice hooks, and they use crampons. Um, now, this is essentially, when you look at the um, relationship between um, learners and uh, experts in terms of interacting with the frozen waterfall, um, sometimes some people think that variability is a problem. That when you see variability in performance, that's a sign of um, uh, lack of skill or um, a, a learner interacting poorly with a particular environment or a structure. What we found was the opposite with the ice climbers here. Um, so on this side here, on this left-hand side, you can see the angles of the ice tools for the upper body and the angles of the crampons for the um, learners, the beginners. Uh, and there's a, there's a picture of a learner there showing essentially that the angles were quite horizontal. So they spent a lot of time in a kind of horizontal position, like an X-shaped X position. And when they climbed, they climbed it like a ladder. It was like this. Okay. On the other hand, look at the variability of the angles of ice tools and crampons of the experts here. Much more variable, adapt, adaptable, really exploring the surface and really using, uh, if you like, the affordances of these ice holes here um, in order to climb up very, very quickly. The point about this is not to sort of uh, say, well, look at these learners, they're very different from the experts, but you can, you can understand these behaviours where these angles, you stay in the X shape quite a long time because it's a stable position, it's highly stable, and that's the biggest intention of the learner, I don't want to fall off. So intentionality here frames the use of perception action, if you like, the way that people adapt the, uh, the, the way they use ice tools and crampon angles, and the, the way they even perceive the affordances of the ice flow. Uh, and this guy in the picture of um, Bernstein, Nikolai Bernstein, the Russian, Russian physiologist, he did a lot of his work in the 30s in Soviet uh, Russia. Uh, his work got translated into English in 1967. Really insightful, like Gibson, a big contributor to ecological dynamics. Um, and essentially what he showed a long time ago with quite primitive technology was that you, if you look at this here, each one of these trajectories that you can see of, these, of this pattern reflects uh, a blacksmith, a skilled blacksmith hitting a nail, okay, a simple task. And what he showed there is that the trajectory of the hammer to hit the nail at this end down the bottom here is never the same. It's not identical. There's variability in there. There's not a great amount of variability, but the variability is functional to help the blacksmith achieve the intention of hitting the, the, uh, the nail with a hammer. Uh, and he provided some rich insights from that very simple descriptive task. Uh, essentially, you've got the intention there, um, and then functionally, to uh, achieve your task goal, people may um, not repeat a movement in an action an absolutely identical way. Um, and he talked about this notion of repetition without repetition. You, you um, heard that a couple of times. Essentially, what that means is that rather than designing a practice task to get someone to repeat an action identically, which you see that even skilled blacksmiths can't do that, 
you can design a task to get someone to solve a movement problem again and again. So what they, what they actually repeat is the process of solving that particular movement problem. So for a golfer, get the ball in the hole on the putt. It's not about producing an identical pattern, but about achieving that consistent outcome time and again, repeated in action. So repetition without repetition is an important phrase there. Okay, so I'm getting near towards the end now of the um, of presentation before I just come to some future directions. Uh, I want to talk about the springboard diving program that Sean Barris, um, this was part of a PhD, um, absolute textbook for me, a textbook sports science PhD project. Those of you who are working on the, um, uh, research in the sports science setting, Sean really nailed it for me here. So she had to keep uh, the Australian Institute, it was funded by the Australian Institute of Sport, uh, Diving Australia, and QUT, part funded, uh, Queensland University of Technology. So she had to keep a group of coaches, elite athletes, practitioners, and academics happy with different outcomes. Okay? Uh, and she spent the first year, I remember I started getting a bit twitchy, a bit nervous after 12, 15 months, observing observing the practices to find out well, what, what, how could she intervene, how could she help the divers and the coaches, how could we get published papers from the research. Uh, and then we found it. Um, so it, it was all to do with their practice model. And yesterday Mark O'Sullivan mentioned this notion of focusing on, um, the importance of focusing on the learner. What's your model of the learner? So as a coach or a practitioner, ask yourself, what is my model of the learner, and what's my model of the learning process? It's quite a fundamental question if you think about it, because if you haven't got one, well, what guides you? What, what guides your, your um, principles when you have to make a decision, etc.? What is your model of the learner and the learning process? I'm not saying that all the, if you've got one, that it's a perfect model or it's right. Sean questioned that and found some issues, some problems. So. There were two problems. With the diving coaches, their model of um, learning was that they had this template of the perfect dive in their mind. And they wanted to, uh, if you like, instruct the, the divers to achieve this template. If they didn't achieve exactly that template that they had in their mind, then there was an error. The, the variability was seen in a negative way and they then introduced some corrections and changes. So there was a perfect template for a dive, and the diver had to do that. The diver had to, if you like, repeat in practice what this template was. And when they achieved it, they were rewarded, they were praised, and when they didn't, negative feedback, instructions, corrections, etc. And that was, so that's, that was the model that guided practice. And another aspect of practice was that um, there was, there was this dry land component. So at that time, and still to a certain extent in some sports, there's this notion that you need thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of practice. You do, you do need a lot of practice volume, but the 10,000 hours rule is, is proven to be a bit of a fallacy. So what that means is in a sport like springboard diving, where it takes time to climb up, prepare, do your dive, into the pool, towel down, go to the coach, get your feedback, go back up again, etc. The number of repetitions uh, are going to be less. So instead, they thought, well, how can we, um, how can we speed this up? How can we get the uh, divers more hours of practice? And one way is, is to break the task down, decompose the task. And so there's this dry land area, and some photographs here from the dry land area, where you've got the springboard simulated, and then you've got the foam pit rather than the pool. And the problem with the foam pit is that you, you don't land hand first like you do. You're judged in competition on, on you landing hand first into the water, ripping the water. In the foam pit, you can't do that, it's too dangerous, etc. And anyway, if you have a look at the diving boards, they don't give you enough uh, leeway to get into the, into the air, do your two and a half somersault, and then land um, hand first. So people would dive and land feet first, as you can see here. 
on the crush mats or the diving pool. So essentially what the coaches were advocating uh, was that you, you can break up the task. You can take out the preparatory phase, the takeoff, the initiation of the aerial phase, take that away, work on it in training, practice, polish it, and then fit it back into the whole movement and that would improve performance. A bit of an assumption, particularly from an ecological dynamics perspective. Okay, so we looked at this, Sean's research, she managed to get, um, we did two studies, uh, we did more than two studies, but two of the studies I want to talk about today was um, she looked at the preparatory phase for the dry land area and the preparatory phase when they actually took off on the springboard and landed in the pool hand first. And she found differences, some key differences here. Essentially, that there were, uh, you could call it scaling differences. The, problem, the, the major problem was the, um, the task goal was, was fundamentally different. So she used the same dive, which was a two and a half back somersault in the pool area, but you couldn't do that in the uh, foam pit. It had to be one somersault and then land um, feet first. And because of it, there were some significant biomechanical differences, some movement organisation differences when it came to interacting with the board. The affordances of the board of the dry land area were different to the affordances of the um, foam pit. But I want to talk about the second study that Sean did, which was an intervention study. So essentially, remember, if you go back to what I was saying about the, learn, the model of the learner and the learning process, <coughs> was that the divers had to perform a perfect dive. If not, negative feedback, correction, let's change it, etc. And what the divers, uh, the habit that the divers got into was to balk, and essentially balking means they go to the end of the takeoff board, they go to uh, takeoff, and then they balk, they stop. They just check out of the dive uh, and they don't carry through with it because they felt that that preparation wasn't conducive to a perfect dive emerging. Okay, And that led to, she observed training, sometimes 200 dives a week were missed because people balked. But what happens in competition when people balk? Does anybody know about that in springboard diving? Just shout out the answer if you know it. No springboard divers here then. Two points, you, uh, you get deducted, two points deducted. So when it comes to competition, you can't balk. You, 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 I mean, you can try and, what they were trying to do was rely on this perfect dive. You have to adapt. If you think that you've done a bit of a sort of a, uh, a, a bit of a dodgy uh, preparation phase, etc., you have to go through with it in competition. So what Sean did was get the buy-in from the coaches and the athletes to change the training approach. Essentially, they said uh, they would. They agreed not to balk um, unless they felt it was dangerous that they were going to injure themselves. They would carry through with the dive in training. Uh, and I want to show you a couple of video clips now. Um, and the first one shows you the balking, and then shows you what happens when they balk in in uh, competition. And then the second one will show you the um, the clip of. Um, the intervention where they embrace their ability. In other words, they, they practice not walking. One of the problems with interacting with the board is that they can um, get to the end of the takeoff board and they're too far away. Um, there's, a, there's a gap before the end of the board and they don't like that. Or they, their toes could hang over. Yeah. Their toes could hang over the end of the board. Uh, which could cause problems, and they call that hanging ten, um, and they don't like that as well. And often they would balk because of those things. So look out for those in, in terms of the affordances of the springboard. In practice, they go to the end, no, didn't fancy that, I'll balk. And this, sometimes 200 trials per week in training. This was the model they practiced. You see, it's a busy, noisy environment.
too far away from the end of the board. Have to go through with it, bit of a splash there, not, not too bad. This one is worse, I think, I seem to remember. Hanging 10, you can see. Yeah, low score. Again, hanging 10. And sometimes, oof, yeah, that would hurt, wouldn't it? That would, that would hurt. And sometimes it, they, they actually adapt quite well, so they can do it. See, that's not too bad, was it? Bit of a slip there, if you look carefully, she just she slips off there. She did, didn't she? she did that, so they can do it. And so the next one, um, so they can do it, you can see that they can adapt if they want to, but the practice model wasn't to adapt, to embrace that variability. So this is what Sean did, you know, which is a fantastic achievement in my view. So here, she didn't fancy it, so she does a simple dive. But she's adapting, she's learning to adapt. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> painful. And what do you notice as they gradually start to get better? Interesting thing is, we did a third paper from the researchers. She, Sean, actually asked the coaches, um, "Why do the athletes balk so much?" And uh, the coaches said, "I don't know why they do that. It drives me nuts." She then asked the athletes, "Why? Why do you balk so much?" Uh, and they said, "Well, I, we think that the coach wants us to do that, to do the perfect dive." So there was some miscommunication there. Understanding. So some, somehow a model of the learner and the learning process had got corrupted in that interaction. Okay, so um, coming towards the end here. Um, so in terms of practice task designs, you can look at, uh, there's a quadrant here that we're working on um, and we're publishing soon. Essentially, <coughs> the notion is that you, you can um, uh, design learning environments that help athletes to adapt. There's a certain amount of uncertainty in there, and there may be more certainty, depending on what the athletes need at a particular time. Um, but also, in, uh, practice environments can be more or less safe, and by that I mean e emotionally safe as well. So if an athlete is exploring and trying to embrace the variability, is a coach being abusive there? Is, is a coach being negative? Are the other teammates being supportive, etc.? Um, and for me, too much practice design goes on in this safe certainty zone, where there's lots of the, the top left zone here, lots of repetition, rehearsal, orchestration of movements, and learning is going along. So all of those will, then, will lead to some sort of form of learning, but it, it's at a very narrow rate. The best learning will go on in this zone here safe uncertainty. So coaches designing practice tasks with a, uh, a bit of um, uncertainty and a bit of variability in, and as soon as the athlete shows any sign of mastery and learning, then being challenged in a certain way, using constraints, manipulating constraints and moving them on, adapting it. You can always go backwards as well to a more um, safe environment or a, a, an environment with narrower affordances, but you can move on as well. So coaches decision making needs to consider that. At this end here, unsafe uncertainty is where coaches become, can become abusive, use of language can be negative and poor, so that's something that we need to keep an eye on. Okay, so a couple of, uh, very quickly, I'm, I am running over time, I, I appreciate that, but a couple of quick messages that, uh, for future research here. I think every sports organisation should have a department of methodology. That's my view. Why? because, for several reasons, but firstly, if you have a substantial theoretical framework that underpins, provides the model of the learner and the learning process for uh, a particular sports organisation, from the youngest athletes to the senior professionals. And that guides the work of all the coaches, all the practitioners, the sports psychologists, etc. They can all interact. 
it means that it gives them a, 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 a framework to work within rather than in silos, separately, being where the athletes are passed, passed on towards a strength and conditioning coach which somehow is separate from decision making, from the psychological and emotional regulation side, from the practice design side, etc. Um, a department of methodology would allow people to use the same pr practical principles. Secondly, then, this is a final slide, okay, um, this is where I think we're at at the moment, okay, so the relationship between experiential knowledge of elite coaches and practitioners, uh, empirical knowledge from theory and data, and you've got this interlocking at the moment. I'm getting some strong signs of a lot of good work, a lot of people working in this zone here. This zone's getting bigger, this interlocking zone's getting bigger at the moment where the knowledge of the practitioners, uh, it's not perfect, and nor is this perfect as well, but it can be enriched, it can enrich each other's work and this make the zone bigger. Uh, my, um, my vision for the future would be to have this zone expand where people have a good understanding of the theory, the science, and the practical application as well. And I'll leave you with that message. Thank you. focus on the technique reproduction rather than uh, do that there will be some learning from that it's not I'm not saying there's com complete complete um, collapse of order um, but it's not very effective from this theoretical um, rationale instead I would um, advocate using variability in a in a very sensible way this is where the coach's skill and knowledge would come in working with the athletes and the other people involved. You know, it could be a strength and conditioning issue, it could be a, a psychological thing, etc. And try to design some variability into some uh, practice tasks. So for me, one of the problems might be that uh, people might say, well, that's it's to do with my drive. I'm going to get on the driving range and I'm just going to hit 200 balls in one go. I think that's the default, that's almost like a lazy option. Instead, it would be um, to uh, think about empowering coaches to be in that space there and be innovative. Think about it. How would you use variability to sort of push, kickstart this athlete, move them on, uh, as it were? Uh, how would you help force them to adapt and, and sort of change, but not in this sort of highly technique focused, mechanical way? but just adapt their actions to the challenges, to the affordances that you might design in the environment. So what affordances might result then in moving on to, to a better swing? Uh, just, just on that, I think it was a conversation with Peter last night, we were talking about how players will go to a tour event, they'll see a shot from the range, and they'll step up the tee, first tee box, and they'll be moved in a different way, and they'll be, they'll be in 
congruency to what they experience in the range mm -hmm. compared to what they experience on the course, because of course on the range there's nothing really, there's not there's a nondescript landscape for them to yeah. nothing for them to engage with. Yeah. And then they go to very engaging the trees, there's other yeah. bottom, there's a the bunker. Yeah. That, that's the intentionality thing that I was talking about there, you know, as a coach, is if you've got that intentionality in, there's some important stuff uh, that you can do, you know, you don't have to be right there on the golf course, for example. Um, a simple thing might be, um, if, you're, if you're practicing games, uh, I'll go back to that, you know, why use cones as markers? Why not use actual markers, uh, the markings on the floor or the field, etc., that can guide your actions, the information that can regulate your actions. Fairly simple stuff that coaches might sort of dismiss. One of the things I saw, I remember I visited the AIS and there was some testing of the Australian cricket squad going on down there. And the uh, fast bowlers, during um, practice and the testing, just ignoring the no ball rule. You know, they get running up to bowl, a yard over the line, you know, a couple of feet behind the line, just ignoring it because it's practice. You know, I would, as a coach, I'd be thinking, that's fundamental, isn't it? I think it's, what's it, 3% of runs in a test match are down to no balls. You give it the opposition, there you go, there's a 3% there's a start. Bring that in. Bring that no ball rule in all the time so that they're, that's the intentionality, that's a major constraint on their bowling action from, um, from early on. Good point, I think. Yeah, I just ask uh, the question about intention, yeah. uh, intentionality. Um, I don't think it's a given that it's always there, even in a dread situation. Mm -hmm. So how do we ensure that the athlete is playing with intention? You can draw your attention to the environment, making it as real as possible. Um, even in the example of climbing, mm -hmm. I have a fear of falling. So, I have a very strong intention to get to that next hold because I don't like to fall. Yeah. Not easy to find intention in field sports. So, like the footage that Mark shared with us last night, there's one young player and it's a drill situation, he's working on footwork through cones. To me, it's just devoid of intentionality. There was, there was no intention. Mm -hmm. But then we flip to uh, the kids playing tag, and it was full of intention, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So that they, as young as they were, were full of intention. They had an objective, they, yeah. they knew what they were doing. So I suppose, I think it's the hardest thing to ensure is that they're always working with intention. Yeah. Sometimes you can set up a drill, yeah. and it's devoid of exactly. intention. It's, there's no, there's no good feeling, no? Yeah, I, I, honestly, that was really eloquent. I really enjoyed that. I think you answered your own question, actually. I think that was superb. Um, absolutely right. Um, I think sometimes, um, I mean, I've, sometimes I've spoken to PhD students and they talk, they're working with coaches, and they'll say that the, um, from this perspective, so coaches say, so uh, my um, tool bag of drills, then, that means that I can throw my drills away. Well. Those drills, they're, they're not static. They're dynamic things that you're changing and adapting all the time. Update them, innovate them. Um, you know, empower coaches to actually uh, sort of um, constantly look at the athlete and say, is that athlete in a comfort zone there? Okay, how do I manipulate, how do I change for that athlete? Which is not the same for that athlete there. Intentionality is just part of that process, I think, where Sometimes, um, it, here's the drill, and we just, we just go ahead and, uh, you know the drill, don't you? Just get on with the drill. But no, you know, sh just change the intention. I think Mark showed that beautifully, without saying at all, I want you to use your left foot and your right foot, just that simple tag game. And the kids were using the left foot, right foot, inside, outside, but they were really focused on the tag. They were getting the tag as well. The intentionality there, was uh, superb, and, and that's, that's an important thing, and I think coaches are really well placed for that. You know how to do that, but don't just ignore it, and don't just think, oh, they don't need reminding, they know what to do. Remind them every time, go back and, uh, and even slightly change it as well, because you know what it's like. There might be a background noise, 
there and you soon zone out of it. You soon, uh, you know, basically, you, you lose awareness of it and it could be the same with the drills, essentially, you just zone out of it. So instead, change it slightly so they can't, so they have to go, oh, okay, right, I've got to, oh, what have I got to do? So they engage with it. And intentionality is a good way of getting engaged with the thing, so. Okay, uh, another round of applause for Professor Davis.